Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse number one. I tell you, uh, definitely wasn't something I was, it wasn't exorcism, it was really just a new CD. And so, uh, praise the Lord for that. And I, I was glad uh, to be able to hear that song. Um, I Stand Redeemed is, is really one of my favorite songs. I, I first learned that song when I worked at a Christian camp in 2000, summer, summer of 2008. And um, we, we sang that as a special each and every week for the campers. And I remember going to a church in Mississippi one Sunday. And I was with, we had a choir group that we had uh, there. And uh, it was a group that they chose of all the camp, all the counselors and all the, the workers, the staff who they thought they could sing. And for some reason, they also chose me. Um, but they, we, we had it and we sang that song. I remember singing that song on Sunday morning at that church and just watching the church people uh, just, just absolutely just burst into tears as they're just, again, just thinking about the fact that we stand redeemed. What a wonderful, wonderful song. Exodus chapter 20, verse numbers, verses 1 through 3 this evening. Uh, I'm going to preach a message, no other gods, no other gods. Look, look in verse number 1, verse number 1 through 3. Let's stand out of respect for the reading of God's word. Verses 1 through 3. The word of God says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and praise you so much for allowing us to stand redeemed before you. Thank you so much for your salvation. Thank you so much for your word. And Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to come to this time of, of, of listening, Lord, to your word. And, and, and Lord, diving into your word. And I pray, Lord, you, you, your spirit will move among us. And your spirit will reveal things in our hearts this evening that, Lord, should not be there. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, you will help us as Christians today to obey this commandment in every single way. And Lord, have no other gods before you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you very much. You may be seated. Now, I just want to tell you a quick story as we get started. Uh, as I think every single person knows in this room, I have a two-year-old and a one-year-old. And we have one on the way, but the story's not about her. Um, still getting used to that one. I'm just going to say that right now. Uh, still, still processing it. Uh, but my two-year-old is really, the last couple weeks has, uh, you know, his, his ability to, to, to listen, his ability to speak, his ability to do things, uh, really just, it, it just keeps seeming to take leaps and bounds. And, and one of those leaps and bounds was within the last two or three weeks. And uh, one of the things I noticed is, well, it, when, I, when I interact with my one-year-old, it is more like, no, no, no don't, don't put that in your mouth. No, don't touch the outlet. No, don't do this. Well, as I do that, one thing I notice is my, my two-year-old has decided to join in with all of that. And so I'll say, no, Kobe, don't put your finger in the outlet. And Charlie will look at him and say, no, Kobe, don't put your finger in the outlet. He's already at two years old, starting what all big siblings do and telling his younger siblings what to do. Now, can I say already, Kobe's not listening to Charlie. Uh, <laughs> but can I say this? Um, he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. And in fact, can I, be, can I be honest? A lot of times, I'll, I'll listen, and you know, they'll be playing maybe in the other room if, if they're for some reason they don't want us to play with them, which is usual. But sometimes they'll be playing in the other room, and Charlie will tell Kobe sometimes to do things that probably he should not do. And can I say this? If Kobe listened to Charlie and, and, and took his authority, authority, over mine, he, he'd be in big trouble. I can say the same. I have experience in this too. I don't know about you, but I have an older sister. And um, if I can say this, older sisters are trials, um, just full of trials and tribulations. They always want to tell you what to do. 
And can I say that sometimes when, when you listen to them, when they tell you what to do and you listen to them, it gets you into trouble. There was one time I was uh, seven or eight years old. I think I was seven years old. Uh, my, my dad was mowing a lawn for a, a person who could not mow his lawn. It was a large, huge lawn. Uh, so he's on the tractor. We were in a, like he was in one part of the huge, you know, property, and we were on the other side and, and blocked by trees. Okay, and, and my, we were picking up the grass, you know, that my dad had mowed and putting into buckets. Well, we were pushing it down and pushing it down. My sister had a brilliant idea. Charles, get in the bucket and jump up and down in the bucket. It'll, it'll smash, and we smash the grass down. We'll fit more in there. So I listened to her stupidly, okay? I listened to her, so I got in the bucket, and I started jumping up and down. And it was like two or three jumps, and I remember it's like slow motion after that. I jump up, and as I jump up, I watch the bucket fall down. And I come down, and I come down hand first, and the next thing I know, I look at my arm, and it's, it's, not, in, it's, it's not in one piece. Uh, for those of you who are squeamish, look away. It, it, it made a U shape. Um, moral of the story, don't listen to your older sisters, okay? Here's the thing. When you listen to authority, and you let the authority that's really actually not your main authority, it gets you in trouble, And when we put other things ahead of God, in the authority that God, in the place that God should have, can I say eventually, it gets you into trouble. It doesn't work right. Exodus 20 verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Don't I look so good right there? Mm, I know. You can't just have one of me. You have to have three, all right? Uh, (laughs) But thou shalt have have no other gods before you. Now, can I just say this? When we look at this command, this is a negative command. It's what we should not do. Now, there is another place in the Bible where God gave this, really, the same command, but in a positive way. We see this in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4 and 5. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Now, our theme for this year is... We'll try that again, all right? Our theme for this year is... Are Are we there yet? And so when we read that verse, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, I'll ask the question, are we there yet? We we come to this first commandment today, and really, as we're going through the wilderness wanderings, can I say this is really even still the beginning of the wilderness wanderings. You might say that Israel's not there yet. In fact, they've got a long way to go. And as we look at the first of the Ten Commandments this evening, I, I want every single one of us to admit that it's just not that we're, we're not there yet. We all have a long way to go. We are very much in need of a merciful God. Now, as we look at this first commandment, we, we cannot ignore the first two. And so we're going to make sure that we look at all three of, of the first three verses of the, of the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus, but as we look at this, think about the setting. Uh, Moses is called up to Mount Sinai. Moses, you could say, is the, is the go-between. God speaks to Moses, and Moses speaks to the people. That is really even what he you know, assumes is going to happen the entire time. But as we look at this first commandment, and even you can take some of this for all ten commandments, but I want to see, when God gives the ten commandments, when God gives this first commandment of thou shalt have no other gods before me, there's a personal dialogue here. There's a personal dialogue. You you look at Exodus 20, at verse number one, it says, and God spake these words. You see, he spoke them. He spoke them. He spoke them in his, with his own voice. He spoke them with his own words. Can I say this? God's not an impersonal force. 
God is not an impersonal force that just moves through you and then just changes you. No, God is a person. And here he, he speaks with his own words, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 22. And these words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount of, out of the midst of the fire, out of, of the cloud, and out of the thick darkness with a great voice. And he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. And it came to pass when ye heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mount did burn with fire, that it came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And ye said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. And we have seen this day that God doth talk to men, and he liveth. Again, going back to the example of my sister telling me to do stuff. And I, can I just say that this wasn't a one-time thing. This happened all the time. She just she thought she was in charge. Now, I, I will also say this. She's much smarter than I am, okay? She's much smarter than I am. So sometimes it helped to listen to her. But even, but even if she came to me... And she told me to do something. Can I say, there wasn't the authority. She didn't have the authority there. And there was just something different coming from one of my parents or coming from her. And even still, even though it had the authority of my parents, there were times when my sister would come and say, Mom or Dad said. And then even though it came from Mom and Dad, there still, it wasn't the same as direct the direct speaking of my mom or dad to me. And so here in this passage, we learn that God spoke. When, when, when the first commandment that says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, this is not Moses speaking. This is God himself speaking. You think about that. We often say that 40 men over 1,500 years wrote down the words of Scripture. We really should amend that because the Bible says that God literally wrote the Ten Commandments. And so the Ten Commandments out of all the Scripture is the part that God literally, literally, literally God wrote. He spoke it and he wrote it. I think, I think this is... Really, because you know, Moses telling the children of Israel that, that, this is, that he is the only God is much less authoritative than God saying it himself. It is so important that we hear God speak for ourselves. That we be in the word of God and God speak to us himself. I have worked, before I came here, I, I really worked with just teenagers um, from when I was out of college until I came here. And... I'd say there's, there were so many heartbreaking times when a teenager would graduate, a teenager would go to college, and they would leave and forsake everything that their parents believed, everything that their church believed, everything that they were taught in youth group. They would just leave it. And really, can, can I say why? It's, it's because they actually never knew it for themselves. They never believed it themselves. Listen, church, we need, to, each and every one of us need to have a personal relationship with God. Kids, you, you can't rest on what just your parents tell you. You need to get in God's word and then study God's word and get to know God and pursue God yourself. It's so important. He spoke it with his own mouth, and again, he wrote it with his own finger. This is not something that God just said, and then Moses wrote down. No, it says in Deuteronomy 5.22, these words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire and out of the cloud out of, and of a thick darkness with a great voice, and he added no more, and he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. Now, why is it important that God wrote? Literally, he wrote down the Ten Commandments. Let me, let me put it this way. My kids have lately just been in a lot of need for prescriptions. Now, it, it, based on the history, I know what works for my kids, and I know what doesn't. And my wife, you know, and if I don't, you know, really, I just ask my wife, and my wife will tell me which medication the kids need. 
What I could do, I am perfectly capable of writing down on a piece of paper what the kids need and signing my name at the bottom just like a doctor. But it doesn't have the authority. When a doctor writes the prescription, because of who he is, it has the authority. And listen, the Ten Commandments, if I can put it this way, are, they're, they're God's prescription for how life works best. And he wrote the prescription with his own hand. And very quickly, I also want to say, he, he, he spoke it with his own voice, he wrote it with his own hand, but he also, he proceeded with his own name. In Exodus 20, verse 2, it says, I am the Lord thy God. He uses the name that he had given to Moses in the burning bush, and he had given to him saying that, look, this isn't a name that I even gave to Abraham. This isn't a name that I gave to, to Jacob. This isn't a name I gave to any of the forefathers. I am Jehovah. It was a personal, personal name. It was his covenant name. It means the self-existent one. He says, I am Jehovah God, I am the Lord thy God, Jehovah God. Now, why does he do that? Well, you think about this. Elohim, the word for God there, really is also the general term for God. So God was being specific. He was being specific. This was this special name for God because of the special relationship that God had with Israel. Names mean something. And this name meant something to the nation of Israel. Now, we have more names for in, now in the New Testament than they did then. Can I say that? We have more names. Think about this, Emmanuel, God with us. One of the ways that they did not go, we talk, talk, talked about this in Sunday school this morning, we know God as Father. Jesus. Jesus says we can call him Friend. He's our father. God is our father. God is our friend. Oh, what a, what a special thing it is to be able to use the names of God. But he spoke using his own name, but can I, and he also spoke to each person individually. Exodus 20 verse 3 begins with the word thou. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, God is speaking to Moses and also speaking to every single one of the people of the tribe of Israel, of the nation of Israel. But he's also speaking to each and every person. The reason we know that, the word thou is, a second, is in second person singular. It's a singular pronoun. God could have used plural, you, ye, but he didn't. You and ye is what you usually would say if you're reading your Bible and it says you or ye. It's usually addressing a crowd. But thou addresses a single person. God is speaking to every single person individually. It's not just a command given to the entire church in general. And so if just one or two people in the church just, you know, they don't really obey this one, then that's okay because the overall church is okay. No, this is a command given to every single person in the church. That every single person, no matter how great or how not great you think you are, thou shalt have no other gods before him. This is a personal command that can be applied to the life of every single Christian. We see a personal dialogue. But you think, you wonder... Why did God give this command? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I think it is because God saw a perceived danger. There was a perceived danger. The nation of Israel, they were facing external forces. You, you, you look back at where they came from. Exodus 22, it tells us, talks about this. I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And out of the house of bondage, they were in Egypt for 400 years. And so I think it was safe to assume that even though they came out of Egypt, maybe not all of Egypt came out of them. Egypt was a place that, that had many, many, many gods, and they added gods all the time. And God is telling him, no, you can't be like the Egyptians, you're separate. 
You're sanctified. I am your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Think about the place where they're going to, the land of Canaan. We know from the Old Testament that there were many gods who the people of Canaan served. And that sadly, so did the Israelites. Because they forgot this command. And even though in this passage we see them say, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. We'll serve only you. Words only go so far. Listen, there are, there are external forces. They want to destroy you. That's why Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and, not, and af- after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. There's so much out there that just want, they, they just, they want to destroy your faith. They want you to serve other gods. They want you to put yourself first. It's all about you. If it feels good, do it. Follow your heart. I think one of the largest dangers these days is, is social media. The largest dangers this day is, is social media. I was a youth director for a year and a half before I came here. Worked with the youth group there for uh, th- about three years even before I became the youth director. And so got very close to a lot of the teenagers. But I can honestly say that there were teenagers that I saw that I, I would look at the assistant pastor. I even looked at my fiance at the time and said, I'm worried about that person. And it really comes down to looking back and knowing now that some of them made it and and some of them didn't. Some of them went away from God and praise the Lord, some of them seem like they're coming back. But the world wants to destroy the young people of this generation. And Satan is using social media. You gotta be careful. Adults, you're you're not immune to it. Satan's gonna try to deceive you. Satan's gonna try to, to, try to, try to conform you to the world. Don't let it. Beware. Watch and pray lest you enter, enter into temptation. Can I say there's an external force that we need to be careful about. There's also, an in, we have to, have to be careful about the internal flesh. There's a battle against the flesh that every single one of us battle each and every single day. James 1 verse 14 says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. Not someone else's, his own lusts. In enticed and lust when it, when it hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. I was listening to a um, message from Paul Chapel, and he shared a story that he had when he went golfing um, with a gentleman from his uh, ministry that he knew. And he says he was golfing with this person, he and, and was, a bunch of people, and then the, the gentleman and his wife were there also. And as his wife was going to get a ball that she had hit, she, she went to, to climb over a chain link fence and fell and broke her arm. We're talking a little broken arms this evening, okay? Um, she broke her arm, uh, and it was a very, very, very bad break, and I'll leave it there. The husband starts moving toward the wife, Paul Chapel said he was right behind the husband. His, the husband looks back at Paul Chapel and, and he says, and you think that he says, call 911. Now, the husband looked back at Paul Chapel and says, can you go get my ball? I don't want to lose it. And continues. This is why you shouldn't play golf. I'm just kidding. <laughs> As for Mr. Brown, he's not even in here. <laughs> he left. <laughs> but that man's priorities were wrong. He, he had allowed golf to have a wrong position in his life. Now, we all, I think, were alarmed by the reaction of that man and being more concerned about a golf ball than about his wife. But if we are all honest, many of us have sports in a position in our life that it should not be. Many of us care too much about our position than we should care too much about power or pleasure. 
Can I say this? Family is good, but when family is put in the wrong position, it can also become a God to you. The Bible says in Luke 14, 26, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, what this is not saying that you have to hate, in other words, not like, dislike your family. What this means is that your love for God should be so great that compared, when you compare your love for your family to your love for God, there shouldn't even be a comparison. It should seem like you hate your, your family compared to your love for God. Your love for God should just be greater. We, cannot, we need to make sure that our family does not take a wrong position in our life. So many times we think too much about money and exalt money to a place where it should not be. Money in and of itself is not evil. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. I think what a lot of people and I think what each and every one of us battle is putting ourself in a position where it should not be. Our ego. I got this from Paul Chapel too. Ego means edging God out. Edging God out. When we get too big, we don't make room for God in our life. Listen, whatever you spend your money and time and energy on, that is your God. I encourage you, go back and just do an inventory of what you spend your time on. Do an inventory of what you spend your money on. What's number one? What's number one? The God you worship will shape the values you hold. Again, Paul Chapel. He had a good message. Right? Had to steal some stuff. I'm giving him credit, so it's okay. But the God you worship will, will shape the values you hold. We need to make sure. We need to really allow God to, to look in us and allow him to reveal the wickedness in our heart. Because I think there's too often times where we profess God. But in reality, we look to every single other thing to function as God. How many of us, when, when, when troubles or trials start, instead of just, just bowing down in prayer and spending time in prayer, we just pick ourselves up by the bootstrap and just press on and move forward and try to figure it out by ourselves? Well, I think we just made ourselves God in that instance. We need to be careful. Because when you think about that, what is that? It is sin. And can I say this? God hates sin. It's not something that we should take lightly. God hates it. It destroys your fellowship with God. It destroys your fellowship with God. You're not a clean vessel to which the Lord can use. We need to humble ourselves. Listen, he is the preeminent deity. He is the preeminent deity. He is preeminent in power. We look at verses 2 and 3 of, of this passage. Is I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Think about the scene. Think about God's power. You think about the scene at Sinai. Exodus 19, verse 16 says, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was all together on smoke. Because the Lord descended on, upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and it waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered him by a voice. You imagine, just get that in your head, the scene, the power showed by God at Mount Sinai. It was great. We have to remember where they also came from too, right? They came from Egypt. 
I think, I think we could say, I think it would be an understatement, that God showed his power in Egypt. God showed his power in Egypt. You think about the plagues, the destruction of Egypt by the plagues. Do you know that each plague was a purposed attack on an Egyptian god? Each play was an, a, a purpose attack. Now, I don't have enough time because I need to get done. But you think about the, the plague of frogs. That was an attack on an Egyptian god that literally had a frog for a head. You think about the darkness. That was an attack on Ra, the sun god. You think about the death of the firstborn. Well, of all the gods of Egypt, the, the god who was said to be the greatest of all, of all gods was Pharaoh. And his firstborn son would have also been considered a god. God showed his power over all the other gods that the Israelites knew. And he came out undefeated. You think about the scene at the Red Sea when... God split the Red Sea. The children of Israel walked through on dry ground. The, Israel, the, the, the Israelites walked through on dry ground. And then the Egyptians, they, they, they tried. <laughs> it didn't work. Their wheels just broke off. And then God allowed the Red Sea to come back on them. And the, the Bible says the Israelites saw them dead on the seashore. Listen, the people that had just subjugated the nation of Israel had just been decimated and destroyed by the God of Israel. Every one of their gods had proven incapable of doing anything to hinder the work of the Lord. You think, well, why is this? Well, God's just not capable of, of, of destroying some puny Egyptian gods. God created the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And even now, he upholds all things by the word of his power. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 3. He is preeminent in power. He's also preeminent in position. And the Bible says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. It says, literally, before me is before my face. So it's not that God's here, and then this is here, and then this is here, and then this is here. No, God's here. There's no one else. God's here. There's nothing else. If anything becomes a God in your life, it's wrong. Even if you say, it's, it, you know, this, this hasn't taken a position above God. No, no other gods no other gods. There is no one like God. Exodus 15, 11, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders? Let's let Jeremiah 10, 6 answer that question. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Isaiah 46, 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. He is preeminent in position. Can I say, he does not like when we allow someone else to take his position. He does not like when we have someone else or something else as a God in our life in addition to him. He's a jealous God. We see in Exodus 20, verse 5, it says in the middle of the verse that he's, that for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. At the end of this month, as my dad said before, I'm going to be married for four whole years. Whew. It's been good. It's been, it's been, it's been great. I, you can ask Kayla, see if she has the same opinion, but I think it's been fantastic. Okay. I spent a whole lot, I've spent a whole lot longer so far single than married. I'll take married every day. Can I say that I have a vow to my wife to be faithful to her? If I was unfaithful to her, she has a right to be jealous. And this isn't like, oh, I wish. No, it's like, I am her husband. If I was unfaithful she has a right to be jealous maybe some people you're, you're not committing the act of adultery but you're still not being faithful you're looking at things on the internet you shouldn't be looking at you're doing things and, and, and just doing things that you should not be doing and even though you're not con committing the, the actual act with someone else you're still not being faithful God hates unfaithfulness. 
God is here in this commandment calling us to be faithful. And the reason is, he says, no man can serve two masters. Matthew 6, 24, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. It's impossible to truly serve two masters. The, the, word, the word servant there, really, when you look at it, it has the idea of, of a slave. A slave cannot do the complete will of two masters. It is impossible How many of us, we are doing the will of something else or someone else more than God? Maybe it's something that's not inherently wrong. I can tell when I was younger, that's something I was addicted. I was addicted to video games. I was addicted. to. I would stay up all night watching video games. Don't tell my parents. I did. I would stay up all night watching video games. And at one point, God convicted me about it. And I knew that I had to stop. And so you know what I did? I got rid of the video games. Because I knew if I didn't, it wasn't going to stop. I wasn't going to stop playing them. Can I say that if there's one thing I really don't do hardly at all, we're even borrowing a Nintendo Switch right now. We've had it for like last month, borrowing it from someone else. And you can ask my wife, we played it like three times in more than a month. Why? Because it's not important. Because there are other things that are more important. God gave me victory over that. And there might be some things in your life that have a wrong position. That God is saying, you need to change this. You need to get rid of this. This needs to be eradicated from your life. Because it's taken the wrong place. And the position that the Bible takes and what we need to do, we really see in Matthew 5, verse 29. If thy right hand or I offend thee, pluck it out, and thy right if, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that, and that, that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Now, I'm not saying that... You should pluck out your eyes and cut off your arms. But just like what I did, listen, I got rid of my gaming system. It was called, basically I'll call it this way, radical amputation. If there's a way that you sin and you know it, make it hard to sin and easy to do right. Make it hard to sin and easy to do right. Let's make it hard to put anything or anyone else in the place that God should be. Because we are commanded to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And I want you to think about what this is. Is this leaving any room for anything else? No. No other gods. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word.